and we'll move on to our first topic, um, which is uh, coronavirus disease in 2019 uh, vaccine. Um, Dr. Beth Bell will give the introduction, please. Dr. Bell. Thank you, Dr. Romero, and uh, welcome to uh, everyone to, to this meeting. As a reminder, in terms of background, um, and you'll hear more about this a little bit later this morning, there are over 200 COVID-19 vaccines currently under development, including um, three in clinical trials in the United States. And the ACIP um, is responding to this ongoing pandemic and accelerated vaccine development through scheduling monthly emergency ACIP meetings or pop-up meetings, as Dr. Cohn says, this being the first. As a reminder, at the June ACIP uh, meeting, um, we reviewed uh, an overview of the COVID-19 vaccine workgroup term and the reference, um, a bit about SARS-CoV-2 disease, immunology, and epidemiology, COVID-19 vaccine development and the vaccine landscape, and considerations around COVID-19 vaccine prioritization. Next, please. Um, our COVID-19 work group um, is uh, now meeting weekly, and during July, uh, we covered the following topics. We reviewed uh, published phase one clinical trial results. We uh, considered um, safety issues around COVID-19 uh, vaccines, and uh, mention again that we have a technical subgroup um, of the work group chaired by Dr. Grace Lee, which is uh, specifically focused on safety issues. We uh, reviewed regulatory mechanisms uh, for the deployment of COVID-19 vaccines with the help of our FDA liaison. We received epidemiology updates, including uh, focusing on COVID-19 in healthcare personnel, which you'll hear more about today. We continued um, uh, our considerations around uh, COVID-19 vaccine prioritization, and we've been um, working now to uh, kind of uh, fill in the evidence to recommendations framework to guide COVID-19 vaccine policy. Next. So um, just to review today's agenda for everyone. Um, first, we'll be hearing um, about COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials from Dr. Julie Le Ledgerwood from NIAID at the NIH. Dr. Catherine Edwards from Vanderbilt University will be discussing COVID-19 vaccine safety considerations. As you heard from Dr. Fink, he'll be uh, exploring in more detail considerations for FDA licensure versus emergency use authorization of COVID-19 vaccines. Dr. Messonnier will discuss considerations for vaccine implementation. Then after the break, we'll hear uh, about the epidemiology of COVID-19 in essential workers, including healthcare personnel. Uh, and continue with two final presentations about vaccine prioritization and evidence to recommendations framework and the work group next steps. Next, please. I just wanted to um, say a couple of further uh, things about, uh, vac about prioritization uh, and the approach that we've been taking. Uh, we've uh, been reviewing considerations for vaccine prioritization in specific groups using a phased approach. Um, as I've mentioned, we spent uh, quite a bit of time in July um, looking at essential workers, including healthcare personnel. And we have uh, plans, and, and there's some specific uh, background uh, and supporting um, evidence collection uh, currently underway to review uh, persons at increased risk for severe COVID-19 disease. Um, and then um, the general population will uh, take up thereafter. As I mentioned, the focus of today's session is on essential workers, including healthcare personnel, and uh, we'll be moving on to um, some of the other groups that I mentioned at uh, upcoming ACIP meetings. Next, please. Now, you've just heard from Dr. Romero a bit about the National Academies of Science, uh, Engineering, and Medicine uh, Committee on Equitable Allocation of Vaccine for the Novel Coronavirus. And I just wanted to provide a little bit of background of that, about that. Um, this is a committee which is uh, co-sponsored by the NIH and CDC, meant to inform the decisions of health authorities, including the ACIP, um, by developing an overarching framework 
um, to assist policymakers both domestically and globally in planning for equitable, equitable allocation of vaccines against COVID-19. And I've listed here um, the um, topics that um, their charge includes, uh, which uh, you can um, look at at your convenience. But as you can see, it's essentially focused around um, equity. Next, please. Finally, I just um, thought I would we would include this uh, slide again just to remind um, the committee and those watching on the live webcast of the uh, the work group members, which include um, for ACIP members, including myself, the ex officios uh, listed here. Um, the CDC co leads are Dr. Kathleen Dooling and Dr. Sarah Mbei, who you will hear from today. A broad range of liaisons. Um, whose uh, input we greatly appreciate, um, and um, several consultants about uh, focusing on safety, ethics, health equity, uh, vaccinology, and immunology, again, whose contributions we are very grateful for. Next. And these are a list of um, some of the many CDC participants who um, we also, again, sort of couldn't really do our work without them, and we know uh, how stretched everyone is and are very grateful for their contribution. Next. I want to thank you very much for your attention and uh, we'll get right in, into this, I guess it's the morning everywhere. Yeah, this morning's um, session, unless there are any questions for me. I'm not seeing any. Um, right. All right, we'll move forward then. Thank, thank you, Dr. Bell. Um, so let me ask uh, Dr. Ledgerwood to um, begin with her presentation, overview of COVID-19 vaccines, uh, vaccine clinical trials, please. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? We, I, we can. Great, okay. So I am uh, Julie Ledgerwood from NIAID. Um, I serve as the Deputy Director and Chief Medical Officer of the Vaccine Research Center at NIAID at NIH. Um, but today I'm here with you as part of the Operation Warp Speed team. Um, I appreciate the invitation and I will update you about our ongoing efficacy trial efforts. Uh, next slide, please. So in May, uh, Drs. Corey, Mascola, Fauci, and Collins published a plan or a vision really of a public-private partnership to, to accelerate the evaluation of primarily um, HHS-funded vaccine candidates with an end goal of accelerating licensure and therefore availability of the vaccines. And this plan has served as the blueprint for the ongoing and upcoming Operation Warp Speed trials. Next slide. Among the entities launched by the USG to combat COVID established in May was Operation Warp Speed or OWS, which is a multi-agency or what we call all of government USG effort being conducted in collaboration with the private sector to provide uh, COVID vaccine development, um, therapeutic development, and diagnostic development. Um, the effort is led by Monsef Flawi, um, General Gustav Perna, and the vaccine leadership is led by Tony Fauci, Francis Collins, and John Mascola from the NIH, and Matt Hepburn from the DOD, with many hundreds of us involved as team members. Um, within OWS, the vaccine development team supports preclinical testing, clinical development, safety monitoring, manufacturing, immune assays, and distribution and access. The funding of these trials is largely through BARDA funding and NIH funding. You may also know of ACTIVE, the public-private partnership established by NIH, um, an idea primarily um, from Francis Collins, established early in the outbreak to bring together top scientists, manufacturers, and others to coordinate the medical countermeasure response to COVID. They are also involved in this effort. And then thirdly on this slide, um, an important aspect of the response to the outbreak is that NIH developed the COVID prevention network. And I'll talk a bit about that on the next slide. Next slide, please. So what we did was we brought together the expertise and the leadership and infrastructure of really almost 
all of the um, existing NIH networks that had experience conducting um, this type of research throughout the country and world. Um, we, we rapidly responded to bring these groups together. They are now charged with um, helping to plan and execute these large-scale USG-funded trials as the COVID prevention network. We call it the CoVPN. You'll see that or hear that. Um, and the vaccine efforts within the CoVPN are led by Larry Corey and Kathy Newsel um, and their teams. Next slide. Um, a snapshot of the CoVPN clinical sites is shown here around the world. Multiple networks merged um, to implement these trials and we have been supplemented what, what were their existing sites with groups um, and sites from the DOD, including um, the VA, from academia, and from private or contract research organization managed sites. That combination has led to an expansive network of site options for the many trials of large numbers of subjects being launched this year. For example, the CoVPN now includes about 117 US sites. That's up from about 50 just a little over a month ago. The sites are also accommodating the growing needs of these upcoming trials. Many have increased their floor space, numbers of staff, um, have added mobile or temporary units to accommodate the trials and adhere to any social distancing requirements in place or necessary where they are. And importantly, um, as these trials are seeking to enroll volunteers from diverse populations, including minority populations at higher risk of COVID, the OWS, NIH, DOD, and COVPN teams, the vaccine developers, and the sites are implementing really impressive recruitment and community outreach efforts to reach these populations. Internationally, the COVPN has around 189 sites to offer to these OWS efficacy trial efforts, and many of those are shown here. Some of the trials that I'll mention will occur in the U.S., uh, continental U.S., some will occur in the continental U.S. with additional international site involvement. For, next slide, please. For, for any given trial, the COVPN sites are being heavily augmented by private or contracted CRO sites. Our team has identified over, our team broadly has identified over 800, almost 900 potential sites that could be um, brought on or activated using various contracting mechanisms through um, various companies to enroll large multi-site efficacy trials. We are adding more sites to this um, list where especially we see um, a need, meaning where the counties in the country are being hardest hit by the outbreak, to ensure that those areas are especially engaged in these efficacy trial efforts for multiple reasons. Um, next slide. So the basis for these um, efforts is, is shown here really, to, to serve the US population and enable rapid vaccine development, we formulated a series of underlying principles, largely from that publication that came out in May, but have been expanded as we've worked on this in the last months. And we call these semi-independent harmonized trials, um, and we're testing multiple vaccine candidates in this way. And so specifically what that means is that the FDA regulatory or IND sponsorship is with the vaccine developer or company. And of course, that is tremendous um, responsibility. Uh, the OWS leadership has been designated teams of experts within the U.S. government to assist each of the uh, corporate partners or, or vaccine developers with planning and execution of the trials. Part of that is largely from that COVPN network I mentioned. So enshrined in that principle, the common elements applied to all trials are use of common um, endpoints, use of collaborating networks such as the COVPN, use of common validated immune assays among collaborating laboratories to ensure consistency and high quality virologic and immunologic readouts among the trials. Uh, additionally, NIAD stood up a common DSMB to be utilized for all of the Operation Warp Speed vaccine trials. They have um, the uh, charge to oversee uh, with a strict um, eye for safety and efficacy, all of these trials. And as you know, a DSMB is an independent body of experts integrated 
to oversee the study. They have already been involved ahead of trial launches and, and during trial design. Um, they are um, will have access to unblinded safety and efficacy data, of course, throughout the trial, and will make uh, um, will have effort to, um, I'm sorry, well, they, they, will have evalu they will evaluate at multiple time points the interim data, both for safety and efficacy during the study. And in the end, as we plan for success, the OWS effort um, will yield um, a between trial immune and statistical analysis of correlates of protection. So this is to enable critical understanding about the vaccine responses and protection incurred from a vaccine or multiple vaccines. Next slide. In that effort to harmonize trial design, um, a large, um, uh, the, the FDA played a large role in that. In um, June, they uh, published this guidance for the development of COVID vaccines. Um, and in that is a very um, clear guidance for trial design and implementation. That is being adhered to by the OWS vaccine teams and developers. Um, and so this has um, given us a, a great deal of insight into the FDA's requirements. And all of this, of course, in an effort to um, advance more rapidly the development of vaccines for the public. Next slide. Um, I'm just pulling out about six of the critical principles that are being used to design the efficacy trials in a consistent way. Um, first, the trials are, of course, randomized, placebo controlled with efficacy endpoints. The sample size of each trial uh, varies, but it's approximately 30,000 volunteers for testing one vaccine. The study populations um, as of now are set to be in um, adults, um, so 18 years of age or greater, with um, targeting a subset of high-risk individuals who are at high risk of both disease and severe disease with an effort to um, enroll diverse populations. The primary endpoint is prevention of symptomatic COVID-19 disease, which is, which is virologically confirmed by PCR. The um, primary efficacy endpoint point estimate is at least 50% as defined by the FDA guidance document. And the statistical success um, should be a lower bound of the confidence interval around the point estimate greater than 30%. So the trials are all designed with this um, common element as per the FDA guidance. Uh, we are using harmonized um, operation warp speed um, directed immunogenicity assays um, and a correlates analysis plan. And as I mentioned, there's a common DSMB managed by NIAID that um, will work with um, all of these trials um, as an independent body to oversee safety and efficacy. Next slide. And so um, the trials that we're actively engaged in as of now uh, for Operation Warp Speed, um, although BARDA supports multiple groups in the development of COVID medical countermeasure development, among those groups, there are four products that we're currently working towards launching um, efficacy trials this year. The first, um, my colleague John Beigel mentioned, which is the Moderna mRNA vaccine. Uh, we um, uh, launch that trial on Monday, July 27th. Moderna will enroll that trial of about 30,000 participants um, at about 89 sites in the United States. Um, additionally, AstraZeneca is developing a product with Operation Warp Speed um, based on an adenovector, adenovirus vector, a, a novel vector, a, a chimpad vector. Um, and that um, trial will occur this year as well with uh, a less precise uh, start date projected. The Janssen or, or, or J&J um, ad vector based trial um, will, our vaccine trial will also start this year um, with um, you know, kind of best efforts and, and all things lined up. Ideally, we would start that trial in September. And then Novavax has a recombinant protein with adjuvant uh, vaccine and that trial uh, with Operation Warp Speed is projected again with um, Projections are, are what they are, but um, our best guess is October 2020. Um, next slide. So on Monday, um, it was a great um, 
deal of work to get there so quickly, but um, just about um, four months after the phase one trial launch, Moderna launched their efficacy trial on July 27th. Um, I mentioned um, it's aim aiming to enroll 30,000 subjects um, at 89, approximately 89 US sites. Next slide. Uh, you may have heard a lot in the news about this trial. Um, that trial is now fully activated and so more details are of course available on clinicaltrials.gov. I encourage you always to look there for accurate information about trials. Um, and as each trial is approved and launched, that information will um, be present on clinicaltrials.gov as well. Next slide. So with multiple large efficacy trials to occur and really launch in just a few months period of time, we knew that um, it would require a lot of extensive public engagement and um, the Coronavirus Prevention Network and NIAID established a website um, that was stood up recently to describe some of these efforts and to engage the public with really basic information um, in a way that really a large group of people can understand what's happening. And that's at coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org. Uh, next uh, slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so within that website, we have um, embedded an opportunity for people who are interested in trials to um, link to a registry, what we call a, a volunteer registry. Um, this is an IRB approved um, kind of click to consent registry where people can in indicate their interest in a vaccine trial um, in general. Uh, they provide their information. They assess um, their risk using a series of questions that were uh, predetermined to um, have some validity in assessing risk. And in just the first 20 days of the website um, launch, we have uh, over four and a half million views as of yesterday and over 200,000 um, part potential participants have registered their personal information um, information about their risk and their willingness to be contacted by a site um, for um, potential enrollment into a clinical trial. We, uh, in addition, have um, augmented this with nationwide, um, broad and local community outreach and engagement activities, also stood up largely by um, Operation Work Speed, DOD, NIH, um, and the in individual vaccine de developers and their contract research organizations and sites. The key to um, success will be um, the recruitment of volunteers who have risk of disease, because as, as you can understand, the trials are endpoint driven. So as cases are accrued, um, efficacy can be evaluated. And we are seeking to enroll from very diverse populations. Obviously the outbreak has um, hit uh, many of the minority populations among us in um, hard ways, and we want to engage them to be fully active in these trials as they proceed. On the left is just a site map um, showing, um, a site trial map just showing broad U.S. coverage. We made a concerted effort to um, have sites represent multiple areas of the country, and some areas are, are obvious. They're metropolitan. They're known to have active outbreaks or be in the um, uh, view of experts in the, at risk of having outbreaks. Others um, are in more rural areas, but have the potential to have outbreaks for um, various reasons. And so sites have been established broadly in an effort to find um, a large diverse population at risk for disease. Next slide. So I'll close there. Um, there are many people um, and many groups involved and I've just labeled them by um, their parent organization here. And I'll um, be happy to take questions during the question period. Very good. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Very informative. Um, so we're open for questions and uh, I'll take uh, Chair's prerogative and uh, ask the first two if I may. So um, on, of those individuals that have um, demonstrated an interest in participating in vaccine trials uh, through your portal of registry, can you tell us um, if we have any information on the ethnicity and race of those individuals? 
Um, and second, uh, that same portal um, uh, is information uh, available in languages other than English. Over. Great, great questions and um, areas of um, a lot of activity for us. So we are we launched the site with um, what we call a soft launch. So really ahead of most of the community engagement efforts. Um, and so, as you can imagine, it's a you know a large um, a large group of people who've registered are um, um, not minorities, but we do have a, a fairly robust minority response. Um, it's the data is still being calculated for the week, uh, and in addition, um, we are establishing parameters with the registry host, which is Oracle, um, to be able to look at the, both the demographic um, data. Um, the um, population information and the risk level in a more robust way in the coming week. So it's a little bit early for me to tell you the specifics on that. Um, but the ongoing community engagement efforts over the next two weeks, we hope will have a major impact on the diversity of the registry population. Um, I think it's um, a pretty impressive effort that's um, being undertaken. Um, and then what was your second question, remind me? Um, okay. uh, that is, um, uh, is, is information regarding the vaccine trials available on that site um, in languages other than English? Oh, right. So right now, the site is fairly general because we launched it ahead of any trial um, opening to accrual, um, and the site is being translated into Spanish. That may not be complete, but it's active right now being done. Uh, so we'll have it in English and Spanish. Um, and in the coming days, uh, we'll um, be highlighting, um, and as trials become active, we'll be highlighting the information about the specific trials in the, in the website as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cohen, I don't see any hands. Are, are there any? Ah, here we go. Uh, Dr. Kimberlin. Uh, David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. Um, I had heard, uh, and and many of us had about the possibility of challenge studies for for testing vaccines, but I've not heard anything recently about it. Can you comment on whether that's under consideration or or not? So there was a lot of discussion about it. Um, some publications came out um, regarding those deliberations. Um, our efforts are targeted at traditional efficacy trials, and probably there are others in the group who could comment on the um, disposition of those efforts about challenge studies and what um, was decided about those. Thank you. Dr. Lee. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, it's very much appreciated. I wanted to know if it'd be possible uh, for on your website whether or not there will be ongoing information posted about you know who's uh, registered, so that we can continue to um, understand the diversity of the populations enrolled. Um, and then I, I just have one other question. Okay, so the question I think was, um, will we post the um, information about the registrants on the website? That's the question. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, and I'm thinking of partly demographics, as you mentioned, and also just partly understanding like risk. So uh -huh. perhaps uh, with location as a proxy, just to get an understanding of where disease activity might be highest and where we're getting. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't know that we have. I, I can take it back to the team. It's an interesting question. I don't think we have a plan to post that information publicly, but we're certainly tracking it. And I can say that as of now, those 200,000 registrants are really from all over the country. Obviously, um, the metropolitan areas have larger numbers associated with them, and uh, it, but it's really all over the country. There's no part of the country where we don't have registrants um, uh, seeking information about the trials. But that's a great thought, and I will take it back to our team working on this. Thank you so much. And then the second question I had was just thinking about the nationwide community outreach and engagement efforts that you're already um, undertaking. Um, uh, it would be great to hear more about how you're doing that and whether or not there are opportunities to sustain that as vaccine is being distributed so that we can uh, continue to understand and uh, learn how to uh, work with communities in an optimal way to be able to um, get vaccines to people where they need it. Yeah, another great question, which is also being um, discussed. And I think there are the, the, the efforts for community engagement are led by um, a couple of people, two of them that come to mind. Uh, Nelson Michael from DOD, who's part of Operation Warp Speed, and um, Jim Kublin from the Coronavirus Prevention Network. Um, they have 
taken a, a great um, deal of responsibility in the area of community engagement, also Hillary Marston from NIAID from Dr. Fauci's office. Um, I think it's a great idea to try to link what they're doing with um, eventual success and distribution of vaccination. Um, I wonder if the um, committee might want to have one of them come and talk with you uh, in the coming month or two about what they're doing. And at that point, much of it will have been launched, so they probably can give you more details about it. Yeah, this is uh, CDC, um, just for the committee and everyone else. Actually, we're already linked into that effort. Um, agree completely with your thought. Actually, several CDC staff um, are on those working groups looking at community engagement and specifically looking to make sure that the community engagement um, seamlessly transitions into the um, future phases of vaccination. So we can certainly update about that, but just as a general principle, I would say it, we're well linked. Thank you. Very good. We'll move, any other comments? All right, moving on to our next uh, person, uh, Dr. Bell. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, one of my questions uh, Dr. Lee just asked, so that's good. I can be briefer. Um, I uh, don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm curious about what information you can provide to us about the other, at least the other BARDA-sponsored um, uh, vaccine development programs that Operation Warp, that are not under the umbrella of Operation Warp Speed, uh, anything about specifically their um, plans for clinical trials, are they going to be using the same sites? Do you have some sense of um, uh, their general strategies, um, whether they're using similar study designs, even though they're not under the umbrella of this um, sort of harmonized schedule uh, vaccine trial uh, design and, and, and just some of those other kinds of uh, general questions? Okay, that's also a great question, Beth. We um, recognize there are other many other groups being funded by BARDA for various components of their work. Um, I am completely locked in, essentially full-time on this effort with these four companies, so I probably am not the right um, best, you know, source of information about other efforts. I will say that the FDA guidance on trial design is pretty clear. We're following it um, really to the letter, and I think you know, most, if not all companies working in the U.S. would be doing that, but really others probably could comment on activities outside of those four partners I mentioned. Thank you. Are there any other questions um, from the uh, voting members? Uh, let's see if there are any questions from uh, ex officios or from uh, members of liaison organizations. All right, there doesn't appear to be. Uh, Dr. Cohn, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, so um, thank you very much for that uh, presentation for addressing our questions. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Edwards, uh, Catherine Edwards, to please come uh, uh, to turn on her microphone and to talk about uh, COVID-19 vaccine safety considerations. Uh, please, Dr. Edwards. Well, uh, good morning, and thank you, everyone, for this invitation, uh, Drs. Romero and Cohen and members of ACIP liaison members and those that are present uh, uh, witnessing the streaming. So I'm very pleased today to talk with you about some safety considerations for COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. <clears throat> So I'm the principal investigator on the CDC-funded CISA uh, assessment project and also um, want to say that my findings and conclusions are, are mine and don't represent the official position of the CDC in that role. Next slide. Next slide. So the outline of the presentation today is going to talk about first previous vaccine-enhanced disease to give you some idea of what we know and what we want to prevent. I'm going to then talk with you about some animal vaccines for SARS-1. I'm going to talk with you a bit about models for SARS-2, challenge, rechallenge, and some of the chimp adeno studies that have been done in the non-human primates. And then I'm going to briefly summarize the very um, encouraging uh, immunologic profiles that we have from the human phase one trials with the chimp adeno vaccine and with two mRNA vaccines, the Moderna and Pfizer. Next slide. 
Next slide. So I'm going to start with RSV. And RSV um, virus was isolated in the late 1950s. And um, at that time, it was felt that, that perhaps an RSV vaccine could be made in the same way that influenza had been vaccine had been made by formalin inactivation of the whole virus. So uh, in the 60s, there was a large clinical trial that administered RSV formalin inactivated whole virus vaccine to infants. Um, and as you see in this study, um, they were given three injections. And antibody responses were measured both by complement fixation and by neutralization. I want to focus on the neutralizing antibody because what you see there is that um, only a small percentage of the children that got the three injections actually developed neutralizing antibody. And in the far right, the mean fold rise of that neutralizing antibody titer when it was compared with natural infection after recovery of the virus was much less. Next slide. The next two years, those children were followed very closely. And what was found is that when you compare the RS lot 100, which is the informal inactivated RSC vaccine with para one, which was a formal inactivated para influenza vaccine, you'll see that the number of hospitalizations of the children that were vaccinated uh, was actually larger than those that, that received para. And more importantly, 80% of those children that were vaccinated were hospitalized and two children died. Next slide. When you look at the autopsy findings of those two children, which are noted on this slide uh, in one and two, compared to the control, you see a deposition of antibody and complement in the actual airways, suggesting that there was an immune-mediated problem that was not seen in the control individual. In addition, uh, although not highlighted here, eosinophils were noted in the lung tissue quite prominently in both patient one and patient two. Next slide. So over the intervening three decades, a lot of information has been acquired to understand what happened in the immune-mediated pathologic reaction that occurred. And as you see in the uh, upper left corner, this is what the structure of an RSV uh, virus looks like uh, by, by crystallography. And it tells us that the virus actually um, has, has binding sites that are very important for the uh, neutralization of the virus. The red and the orange are at the tip, tip of the virus that the individual would see when they were infected with the virus. In contrast, the, the uh, crystal structure below of the fused membrane is what happens when there's formalin inactivation of the virus so that, that the uh, epitopes that are measured or that are shown in red and orange are really gone. And now what you have is purple and blue. And the function of the neutralization of the purple and the blue is much less suggesting then that you have to understand the structure of the virus and make sure that you do not destroy the structure of the virus when you make a vaccine. Next slide. Another adverse event with vaccines was shown several years ago with the dengue vaccine. In this particular trial, um, this, the, the actual serostatus of the vaccine was looked at in terms of the efficacy of the vaccine. Next slide. What you see here is the risk of hospitalization for virologically confirmed dengue and severe dengue in children two to four years of age. In the children that had been immunized, if they were seropositive before they were immunized, meaning that they had seen the natural virus, 
they actually were boosted and were protected against disease, as you see by the circles that, uh, and the, the hash marks that appeared to the left of the uh, risk ratio. In contrast, those children who were seronegative before but received the dengue vaccine that was not as functionally, uh, functional in terms of neutralizing the virus after the vaccine had been made, and they actually had a worsening outcome uh, than, than uh, those who were not vaccinated. So the control patients who were seronegative did better in terms of dengue disease. Next slide. So how do we put these uh, uh, findings uh, in some context? And a very nice article that appeared this year in Science by Dr. Graham, I think does a really nice job. In terms of vaccine-enhanced disease that is antibody-mediated, we certainly, through the dengue, we show that antibody-dependent enhancement are actually increases of the amount of virus uh, into the, the cells can occur if antibody is not directed to the neutralizing epitope. As with RSV, vaccine-induced respiratory disease can also occur as a function of antibody, but also T cells. The mechanisms are shown here in FC-mediated increase in viral entry that you see with dengue or immune complex formation with complement deposition, as you see with RSV, and the TH uh, and the T cell response in those situations uh, with the, the enhanced respiratory disease is TH2 biased. The effectors are macrophage activation, inflammatory cytokines, complement activation, and the mitigation or prevention of those vaccine enhanced disease uh, would be administering uh, vaccines that are confirmationally correct and, and the generation of high quality neutralizing antibody and the T cell response that we would want to mitigate against these adverse events are Th1 biasing immunization with strong CD8 T cell responses. Next slide. So what do we know about, uh, about vaccines against coronavirus? And, and in early March or mid-March, there was a consensus meeting that was held that was sponsored by the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiatives, or CEPI, and the Brighton Collaboration. And what it included was um, two five-hour sessions where the experts who had conducted vaccine studies with, with uh, coronaviruses met presented information and discussed uh, the actual data that, that uh, was available. And I'd like to summarize that in the next two slides. Next slide. So what they did was they looked at those models of enhanced disease in vaccine studies after SARS-1 vaccine. And all of these models were, were, uh, were animal models. Most were murine. Uh, a couple were non-human primates. A number of the studies had included alum adjuvants, which often primes for a Th2 response, and all of them were associated with immunopathology. Next slide. One of those representative uh, experiments is shown here. And this is a study that was done by Dr. Barrick and his, his group, who, and Dr. Barrick is a leader in coronavirus research, and they took a whole corona SARS-1 uh, virus, they inactivated, and they administered it to mice, and then they challenged the mice with SARS-1. Next slide. What you see here on this slide is that um, in the lower right-hand corner, you see that the lung titer of the immunized mice was clearly less than it was in the control. But what you also see is in the slides of the tissue that there were eosinophils that came as well, sort of rem reminiscent of the RSV-enhanced disease that was seen there. So again, documenting that the antibody did have a functional activity in decreasing viruses, but there was immunopathology that was noted. Next slide. So the, the 
collaboration and consensus meeting, which which I think is very good reading, um, had a number of conclusions. One is that they considered the demonstration of some immune enhancement with any vaccine candidate after a viral challenge in animal models should not necessarily represent a no-go for deciding whether to progress in clinical development. But the continuous monitoring of the risk during clinical trials in an epidemic would be needed, that each observed effect should be discussed with their developers, and that they wholeheartedly endorsed the uh, mitigation strategy of functional neutralizing antibody and a Th1 response. Next slide. So, so uh, very shortly after uh, the identification of the, of the SARS-2 virus, a number of non-human primate studies were conducted. And this is one of the first that appeared in science. Um, and it just shows that, that if you indeed give the, the SARS-2 virus to, uh, to non-human primates, that there is uh, uh, infection that you see in panel A that interestingly, the infection in old primates is greater than in young primates, which may be somewhat reflective of what we see um, in, in people. Um, and if you look, um, you'll see that the predominant or, or the, that, that a lot of virus is present in the lung. So suggesting to us that this was a really nice model to look at uh, vaccines and vaccine challenges to see whether there might be enhanced pathology. Next slide. Also, you'll see here, uh, these are pathologic findings in the lung, which, you'll sh which uh, after the, the non-human primate challenge, um, you'll see pneumonia was, was demonstrated, there was, uh, there was uh, edema in the lungs, and there was actual virus both in the lung tissue as shown in G and, and H and I, and in the ciliated epithelial cells. So again, confirming that this was a really good model that pulmonary pathology could be assessed. Next slide. So followed uh, several studies that looked to see whether this actual SARS infection per se protected against rechallenge in these non-human primates. So in group one that got 10 to the sixth of a virus, group two that got 10 to the five, and group uh, two that got 10 to the four, you'll see that that uh, neutralizing antibody and Th1 responses were seen after the initial infection. So suggesting to us uh, and, re and reassuring us that the type of antibody and T cell responses that we wanted to have uh, were present with the natural infection. Next slide. So what you see here is uh, the actual uh, uh, challenge of these animals who had, who had been infected. You'll see that, that by and large, there was no virus at all detected in the, in the bronchoalveolar lavage on rechallenge. that there was some virus that was detected in B, uh, uh, initially in the nose, but very, very quickly went away as in the nasal swab. So suggesting again that in this natural infection, when the animals were rechallenged, that the animals were protected uh, from certainly lung, lung uh, disease, but also protected from and decreased uh, uh, virus in the nose. And pathologic findings in these animals did not indicate uh, any kind of eosinic, eosinophilic infiltrate, which might be seen if there was a pathologic response. Next slide. So I'm going to go through one um, study of uh, where uh, humans, where vaccines were that are being used in humans now were studied in non-human primates. Next slide. This is a study uh, where the chimp adeno produced by Oxford uh, or the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, was used to vaccinate uh, rhesus macaques. And it's the, the red dots represent the animals that received the vaccine. Um, and the blue squares represent the animals that received the control. What this slide shows is that the ELISA antibody titers after the inoculation uh, were, were robust with the CHIMP uh, adenovirus vaccine. 
that the neutralizing titer, which is shown in panel C, which is functional antibody, was very good. And, um, and also in the last panel that the ability to generate a TH1 response in the, in the chimp adeno recipients was also robust. This was a one-dose vaccine and not a two-dose, uh, but again, it showed that there was both humoral and cellular immune responses generated. Next slide. When the animals were challenged, um, the clinical scores are shown in panel A, but again, the, the chimp adeno vaccine in red, um, the control in blue, you will see that, that, there, was, that there were some uh, clinical symptoms that were seen uh, at challenge. Um, however, they were markedly less um, as, uh, that the, than the blue. And also that when you looked at the BAL fluid seen in panel B, that there was very little uh, 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 copies of the virus in the lungs. There was some virus in the lungs, in the nose, in panel C in the red group, but that rapidly decreased uh, so that by five and seven days, it was largely gone. Re yesterday, there was a beautiful paper in the New England Journal that, that uh, discussed the challenge, the immunization with the Moderna mRNA vaccine and the challenge uh, with natural uh, disease. Uh, that came out too late to put in my slides, but I would encourage you to read that. Um, and you'll see very much the same kind of information in the reassuring ability for the vaccine to prevent pulmonary disease and also a neutralizing and a, a, a TH1 immune response. Next slide. Next slide. Um, and five, whoops, one more, one back. The lungs. And what you'll see here are these histologic pictures of the control animals that show um, the virus and, and the infiltration um, uh, in the control animals who were not given vaccine and the immunized animals below and shows again that there is no infiltrate, no immune composition, immune deposition, and no eosinophilia noted in these animals. So again, reassuring us that the animal models suggest that the immune response is appropriate. Next slide. So now I'm going to go over some vaccine studies in humans. Next slide. As you know, um, there have been, uh, uh, in the past two weeks, there have been uh, reports from uh, of three phase one vaccine trials um, that are, are very uh, reassuring, and I'm going to go quickly through those. This is the uh, chimp adeno study um, that, was, that appeared in the Lancet. What you see here um, is the safety of the vaccine, um, and this is, is you'll see that, that um, that with the uh, with the the first dose um, and, and uh, which is all that was given in in this particular study, that there was some pain and tenderness uh, in the local injection sites, um, and that that a number of these individuals did need to take um, a paracetamol uh, for those symptoms. So suggesting that there was local reaction. Uh, next slide. Um, and, uh, it also was, was uh, apparent that there was a generation of a good antibody. This vaccine study had a control, the meninge A, which is shown in blue, and you'll see there was no antibody generated uh, with two, uh, to, COVID, or to SARS-2 um, with the meningococcal uh, vaccine, the control vaccine, but as you see there, within 14 days after vaccination in the uh, recipients of the single dose, there was a very good immune response, and 10 individuals in, in, uh, in the third panel got a boost of the vaccine, and again, showing that the neutralizing antibody, or that the, the antibody, the ELISA antibody, was very good, and it was comparable to what was seen in panel B in individuals who were convalescent from natural COVID-19 infection. Next slide. Um, it also showed uh, that the immune responses were generated, uh, that there were LE spot uh, to interfere on one, which is consistent with the TH1 response that we're seeing both in the prime 
uh, recipients that appeared at, at, at as early as 14 days of age and in the prime boost, those 10 individuals who had gotten two doses of vaccine. So again, suggesting that this particular vaccine, like we had seen in the non-human primates, generated a functional antibody response and a Th1 kind of T, uh, T cell response. Next slide. The uh, Moderna mRNA vaccine, which was uh, was was uh, was part of the, of the uh, NIH consortium, uh, was reported in the New England Journal. Next slide. You'll see from this study that there were 25 individuals in each, or excuse me, 15 individuals in each group, um, and that largely the, the population that participated in this study was a, a Caucasian population with a mean age of around 30 to 35. Next slide. What you'll see here uh, are those symptoms that are both uh, uh, systemic um, and, and, and also local. Um, and again, like we saw with the chimp adeno, that there are mild and moderate uh, local and systemic responses that are, are seen after the first dose and after the second dose. Those that are more severe um, were, were seen only um, in, in those individuals that had gotten the highest dose, and, and that, was, uh, that was not uh, given to all people after that those, those uh, responses were seen. Again, suggesting that there is local and mild systemic responses, such as, as uh, some mild, some fever and some headache and, and other symptoms, but there were no complaints or no symptoms of any kind of respiratory issues, which you might see if, there, if you were concerned with enhanced disease. Next slide. And, and in the right lower column, this is a functional neutralizing assay where the sera in the individual's uh, were actually taken into the lab and, and neutralized with wild-type coronavirus, and the titers, the neutralized and titers, were very high, as you see here, both in the lower and the higher dose. Uh, next slide. So we uh, suggesting again that that vaccine was was uh, uh, was generating neutralizing and CT uh, and, T and Th1 kinds of responses. The final study, um, which is is. Uh, uh, was shown here, which is the of the Pfizer study, um, uh, included 12 individuals in each of the group and nine placebos. Next slide. The local reactions, um, as you'll see here, after dose one and dose two, um, are, are reminiscent of those that we saw um, in the earlier studies. Next slide. The systemic reactions of, of pain and and, uh, and and headache and some of the other findings are also consistent with what we had seen before. However, there were no grade four reactions, which is shown in red. Next slide. Their immune responses were looked at in actual binding, the receptor binding domain assays, um, as you see here. Um, and really, interestingly enough, almost all of the of the dose or of the doses at 10, 30, and 100 gave really robust uh, binding functional antibody. Um, and when it's compared with the with the black bar, which is human convalescent sera, suggesting that um, that robust functional neutralizing antibody was present. And, um, and, and certainly um, the neutralizing antibody that's shown in the lower part uh, was, was quite robust as well. Next slide. So I, I'd like to leave you with a couple of, of, uh, uh, of important points. I think that, that in order to uh, attenuate the, the risks or alleviate the, the risks that are potential vaccines, that we do need to think about the correct antigens and the high quality neutralizing antibody. We need to think about Th1 uh, biasing immunization and the role of CD8 T cells as we reviewed early on. Next slide. Um, we also need to make sure, um, just as Julie had said, that we have standardized comprehensive safety assessments for both local and systemic reactions. And there, is, there has been a, con a concerted effort to, to uh, standardize those, certainly in the NIH-funded studies, but also there is a commonality in the other uh, studies as well. And that we need to be, be carefully assessing uh, biomarkers of vaccine 
uh, enhanced disease, ratios of neutralizing versus non-neutralizing antibody, which was so, shown to be so important in RSV uh, disease, antibody isotypes, affinities, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and the polarities of the T-cell responses. Next slide. So my conclusions are that an effective vaccine will likely be achieved with one of the vaccine approaches. And I think that the data that we have from the three initial phase one studies are very encouraging for all three vaccines. And I think this is a time when we hope everyone gets a home run that vaccine safety will be meticulously assessed in terms of looking at these uh, mechanisms, but also at each level of study, the uh, uh, DSMBs, which Julie went over, are looking at all of the reactions that are seen in a very meticulous way. If enhanced disease or indications of that occurred, there will be assessment of the in, immune mechanisms that, that might be involved um, and certainly a safe and effective vaccine that is widely available would likely induce herd immunity and herd immunity would allow us to resume our normal activities. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Edwards, for that very um, informative and broad ranging uh, uh, review. Um, we'll open it up to uh, discussion and questions. Um, I can see that Dr. Atmar um, has a question. Dr. Atmar, please go forward. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Edward, for that great presentation. I, I was wondering whether you could speculate on the differences that have been seen between what you showed in, with the SARS-1 coronavirus uh, vaccine efforts and animal models and those uh, data that are available for the constructs that have been um, reported for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the, almost all the, or all the trials that you had on your slide showed some immunopathology with the SARS-1 vaccines in various formats, and that hasn't been seen with uh, or reported, to my knowledge, with the SARS-CoV-2 yet. That's correct, uh, Bob. And, and I think that, that um, a couple of things need to be noted. Um, one is that a number of those studies were in mice. Um, and, um, and I think that one of the discussion points that was made um, is that, that indeed um, these mouse models can be um, somewhat difficult and, and sometimes there can be the development of allergic components to you know, parts of the, um, of the media to grow the virus and, and some of the other issues um, in terms of that. I think also um, the experts and, and uh, in coronavirus sort of felt that that, that in general, there was a gradation that, that um, certainly the responses, the adverse responses in animal models were seen more commonly with SARS-1 than with MERS, um, whether that was a function of, of maybe advances in terms of the animal studies. Um, I think it's hard to know. And, and both of those were seen more commonly because really those, those, have, those kind of adverse events have not been seen um, in the animal models of, of SARS-2. The other thing that I think is probably important to know is that there are some other SARS-1 uh, studies that were done uh, first in, in humans. There were there are a couple phase one studies of, of DNA vaccines in SARS-1 um, that, that didn't induce any kind of adverse human response. Um, and and uh, obviously those numbers were small. And as you know, also there have been some MERS vaccine candidates. There's an mRNA MERS vaccine candidate that's been looked at, and you know, in animals to, in animals also, and that doesn't appear to be associated with the uh, with the signal. So I think that um, I think that that whether it's a function that some of these studies were done longer ago, and maybe the methodology wasn't quite as, as, as rigid, um, or whether they're you know, a function of a mouse and not a man. Um, I, I think that, uh, but I think that we cannot, um, you know, we certainly can't dismiss this. But I think what I, I'd like people to hear is that we aren't dismissing this, you know, that we're really digging down to try and see what all of this information has taught us to get all the people together that have done these studies and, and you know, like the, like the consortium and, and that they really feel that, that uh, given those signals, that if we look for these other signals and look in animal models, that, that we really can do this in a very safe way. 
Thank you. Dr. Bell. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Edwards. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you to reflect a little bit about the issue of detection of these adverse events and expected timing of adverse events and understanding that there have been some efforts to standardize case definitions, um, what difficulties might be in um, identifying the adverse events, and, and just give us a bit of a sense of your feeling about, um, I'm going to ask you now an unanswerable question, but um, or what the difficulties might be in uh, detecting um, this sort of serious adverse event if it uh, were to occur? Certainly. So um, I think that, that these are hard questions. Um, I think that, um, that, that uh, experts are, you know, that there's work in the Brighton collaboration that is, is working on, um, you know, identification and characterization of adverse events, which I think have been so powerful so, for so many other kinds of, of uh, adverse events and some of the, um, so I think that's really important and, and, you know, that will include pulmonary experts and critical care and all of those so that we can really see, um, you know, what we might expect. Um, I think that, that there will also be um, an active effort by the DSMBs um, that will, um, you know, be looking at each adverse event as, as phase two and phase three um, uh, uh, studies are rolled out that each uh, adverse event that may be unusual will be looked at in great care by the DSMBs um, that are independent of the, of the investigators and the manufacturers, that there will be a clear understanding of what the background rate uh, for these adverse events will be in the population. If, you, if the rate of an adverse event in the normal population is one in a thousand, and we see that uh, rate in a in in the vaccine study, then that um, that may not be as worrisome. But if the rate is one in a thousand, and we see it in in uh, one in ten of the people that are in the vaccine study, that certainly is a a, uh, a concern. So that is also being looked at, and um, I think that there will also need to be a characterization of the severity of the diseases that we see. And I think that the NIH has spent a fair amount of time in, in their studies thinking about how we characterize disease after if after it occurs. And, and so I think we'd have to look and make sure that the people that didn't receive, that the, the vaccine recipients, that there are not some individuals that, um, that have severe, that acquire uh, COVID-19 disease and have severe disease. And why would that be? And, and there will be, you know, the ability in, in those individuals to look at cytokines and look at immune me mechanisms. Um, so I think that's going to be very important. Um, I think also, you know, certainly the, the ISO group and CDC and which we're part of, um, we're, we're thinking about how we're going to respond to questions once it's licensed. And also, I know the FDA has been really looking very carefully in, in deciding how they're going to look at large like, databases for symptoms. And, and so I think we're all working very hard on this, uh, doing it with great care. And I think people need to understand that if there is a signal, we want to see it. And, and we will, you know, everything that doesn't look like it should happen, we uh, the DSMBs and will will be investigating pre-licensure and all of this will be assessed post-licensure in a very meticulous way. Dr. Sanchez. I think that was, that was great. Um, I have a question and a couple of comments. Um, first of all, um, you, know, you know, the issue of, um, you know, of enhanced disease with three challenge is of major concern considering the inflammatory changes that are some of these individuals experience and with the worst disease, at least um, have been in these vaccine trials. I know that they've enrolled very few, but do we know um, if any of them have developed disease, even, I know that the numbers are small, to say whether with any of these three trials, there's been any sort of, um, you know, hospitalizations, disease, and any who may have been infected naturally. That's one question, and then the other. So let me answer. Let me answer that before okay. because I can't, I might not be able to remember. Too okay. much. <laughs> um, so the answer to the question, to my knowledge, there have not been any cases that have been reported uh, in these recipients, um, and and that doesn't mean that they may not be, but to my knowledge, uh, no. Um, to my knowledge, also there have not been um, any 
SAEs. Um, and, and so SAEs would be hospitalization. And, and, uh, um, and so for many of the studies, um, you know, if there was an SAE, um, likely the studies would be halted, um, you know, for specific. And each of the studies has specific halting criteria. So that if one of these were to happen, that if there was an SAE that you know, was associated with hospitalization or severe disease, um, you know, then, then the study would be halted and the patients would be looked at. Now, I don't, I'm not familiar off the top of my head what the, what the halting rules for each of the studies, but, you know, but, but those kinds of things are also built into. And to my knowledge, that has not been the case for any of the, of the vaccines. Well, that's certainly reassuring to move forward as, as they are. But, and then my other question is the age groups. So, you know, the highest risk groups are in the elderly, and at least in one of them, I think it was up to 55 years old, um, and, the, and I, I don't know um, what is the age groups for the planned phase three trials. I mean, because obviously, you know, those who are above 55 to 60 um, and with other vaccines, they may not respond immunologically, and so it's... Um, I was just interested in seeing what is the plan for so each of each yeah. of the phase three trials uh, recruited older individuals. However, um, the time frame to report the um, the, the younger group uh, was so tight that those that those were reported. But um, and if you see, you know, most of the studies say it's an interim report. Um, so all of those age groups were included. Um, in phase one, I mean, all the, the older people were included um, in the phase one trials for all of the, of the vaccines. Um, I have not seen the published data um, about the different ages um, and, you know, what the immune responses would be or are currently. I don't know whether John could come, John Beigel might be able to comment on, on some of the uh, immune responses in the older population in the Moderna trial, uh, for instance. Um, so, so obviously that is a is a question. I think it is fascinating if you look at uh, immune responses to natural disease. Um, it seems like the uh, the oldies um, uh, have uh, antibody responses that sometimes are higher than the youngies. So I don't know whether that will be the case for vaccine, but that population is being looked at. Um, also, there there are um, protocols that are being designed for. Uh, for the use of vaccine in children and in pregnant women um, through the NIH and and, uh, um, and probably from the other companies, but I'm not I'm not quite sure of those. So so that's sort sort of what's happening in in uh, in terms of, of other older people. Well, oh, thank you. My other question was the the children, especially with the recent um, was it South Korea that showed that what the adolescent ones that there's um, there's a there was um, potential for. Um, being vectors in the young, you know, not the less than 10, but I think the 10 to 20 age range or something. Right, right. Or maybe over 10, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. So those are planned as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Incredible presentation, uh, Kathy. Thank you. I, I, I just had a question. Um, are there any theoretical safety concerns for individuals who will have received the flu vaccine and then subsequently a COVID-19 vaccine? Um, there are not any theoretical um, uh, concerns, although all of the individuals that will um, be participating in the phase three trials, I think from all of the companies, um, and, and uh, uh, will uh, not be able to get the flu vaccine at the same time as the experimental vaccine, as you know, as, as you know, with all of the trials, it would have to be um, separated by 14 days, or uh, you know, for for an activated or a month for a live. So, um, and and I think there will indeed be uh, encouragement for uh, everyone to be vaccinated, as Nancy Messonnier said before. Everyone needs their flu vaccine. So, but they will not be given concurrently. Um, and and I don't think there's any theoretical concern um, that there would be interference. Thank you. Dr. Fink, please. Uh, hi, I, maybe this will, will help to um, address Dr. Sanchez's question about uh, inclusion of, of elderly uh, subjects in, in phase three clinical trials. Uh, 
as outlined in our, our guidance that we released at the end of June, it's FDA's expectation that in order to advance clinical development to include individuals at a greater risk of more severe COVID-19 um, and to advance clinical trials to include very large numbers um, of subjects who uh, have medical comorbidities in, in phase three trials, we would expect to see uh, not only uh, safety data um, specific for uh, age subgroups, including uh, elderly uh, subgroups, but also immunogenicity data in those age subgroups to support the potential uh, for vaccine effectiveness and also uh, low risk of vaccine associated advanced respiratory disease. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fink. I, I also want to applaud, as Julie did, the wonderful guidance document. I think it's it's so so helpful for all of us as we go forward. And I I just wanted to uh, um, acknowledge what a great great effort um, and great work it was. Thank you. Are there any other questions before we close this uh, this session? Jose, can you hear me? This is Sean O'Leary. Yes, Sean. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand up. It's, forgive me. Yeah, I don't have a way. I was I messaged you, but I don't have a way to do my hand. Um, oh, forgive me. I <laughs> I can't multitask very well. Go ahead. Sorry, um, Kathy. Thanks for that great presentation. I, I I'm just inter interested in your thoughts on a couple of issues. Um, one, my understanding is that for these trials, they're enrolling um, seronegative individuals, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the implications for that once. They're rolled out in the larger populations. You know, does that mean people need an antibody test before they get vaccinated? And then the second one is somewhat related. I, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the potential for um, a, a vaccine. I know we're not doing it in children yet, but um, you know, it's down the road. How a vaccine could potentially trigger or not trigger MISC, given the level of uncertainty we have around that condition. Okay, so um, thank you for those questions. First question um, is that, that there will there isn't a zero screening um, in the studies, um, so that that people obviously there's a blood drawn before you get the vaccine, um, and uh, and there's a blood drawn after you get the vaccine, and and there are you know since the the, the vaccines are primarily spike protein related. Um, there are other parts of the virus that could be used serologically to prove whether people are infected. Um, and also before you get a vaccine, then you would be able to look at antibody responses. But there is no, um, there has been no screening for that. It just is practically um, impossible. And there will be no screening in the phase three trials. It just doesn't work. Um, and and uh, so uh, it just too, it would be too hard with 30,000 people. And, and uh, so that will not be done. Um, I don't, think that, well, I, I haven't heard uh, that any of the people that were enrolled were already seropositive, but perhaps some of them were. I don't, I, I know a little bit more about the Moderna trial than, than maybe the, the Pfizer trial in terms of whether anybody was positive. I know, um, so that may be something that, that um, you know, it would be interesting to see uh, if somebody was there positive before, what the vaccine would do, and I would imagine if it's kind of like the the challenge boost that we saw from the chimpad, no, probably you're going to get a you know a big boost if you'd had it before. But there will not be screening, um, and there's actually no um, evidence to say that that um, you know that that there would be enhanced uh, problem with with that. Um, in terms of the the, the pediatric studies, um, I think that that. Um, it will be um, important. Obviously, they're going to be done in a very careful way. I'm not quite sure when they will start. That will be um, a function of, of sort of what, what data we're getting from the, from the adult studies, the phase three studies, um, and also when we have a large, larger safety database. Um, I think the other thing that will be important to assess um, is, um, you know, the burden of, of disease in each population. And I think is, is the point that, you know, was, that, that was made um, is that, you know, maybe the risk benefit of, of a pediatric vaccine would be greater for um, the teenagers than it would be for the, you know, for the two to five years old. So again, that may be another factor. Um, and I guess the other thing is if we do see an enhanced disease, I would hope that we would be able to, you know, dissect what's happening with that. I also hope 
that the whole understanding of the MISC um, could be much enhanced if we, you know, if we were able to to look at the character of the responses and, you know, and what happens with their T cells and those sorts of things, and maybe be able to get some um, some some more information about that. But I think that, you know, obviously enhanced disease. Um, and, and the fact that a lot of, of uh, the you know, COVID-19 disease looks a bit immunologically mediated is also a concern, and I think we have to proceed very carefully. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I think that my concern with MISC is that we don't know what, immune, what the immune trigger is, <laughs> you know, what, what's to say that it wouldn't be the vaccine. Yeah. Um, I think that's, you know, obviously, the, I always say the most important thing is research, and obviously that we need to do that more with MISC to sort of understand, you know, what kind of response is triggered and, and, uh, um, and is it a, um, is an effective response, and, and I think that's really important. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez, I see your hand is up. Is, is that? Uh, yes, yes. So, please, Kathy, please. I had another question. Um, how do you envision the vaccine among our immunocompromised patients and whether should we be looking at maybe the monoclonal antibodies or, um, and are there, what's the plan for that group? Um, I, I think that that, um, that also will be an important question. Um, I think that, that, you know, there has been discussion about um, HIV infected people and whether their viral load is, is controlled, whether they could be part of these phase three trials. And I don't know that that's been answered. Um, so I think that's one question. Um, I also think that, that it may be that, um, that there needs to be, um, you, know, diff you know, it may be that certain vaccines work better for certain individuals. And it may be that, you know, you need an adjuvant for those individuals who have, you know, immune responses that may not be um, as, as good. Um, I think also, as Julie mentioned, um, and actually as I'm the chair of the DSMB, there's a lot of, of excitement and effort going into the monoclonal antibodies. Um, and that is a whole group in the, um, in the active um, that is going forward. And, and so at this point, there, um, the monoclonal antibodies are, are uh, going to be studied in terms of, of people that have been exposed or in nursing home recipients, but um, it would seem to me that that um, this would be a great group, you know, people that are are immunocompromised, um, to participate in some of those uh, those efforts as well. So that is another um, arm that's being investigated and, and is going uh, very rapidly as well. So that's a great point. Thank you. So uh, let me again ask um, for anyone who cannot raise their hand. Uh, thank you for bringing that to my attention, Dr. Lee. Um, does anyone ha else have a question? Okay. Uh, Dr. Cohn, do you have any words for us before we break for, uh, for lunch on the East Coast and breakfast on the West? Um, I do not. Um, I hope everyone has uh, a few minutes to take a break, um, get some lunch, or as you said, breakfast or coffee. Um, and we will return back here at 1230 uh, with a, a presentation uh, from Doran Fink from FDA. Very good. This portion of the meeting is gavel closed.